Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young, Drew Galloway. We are all here on this Monday after all the dust has settled on the regular season of college basketball. And everybody knows their outcomes and results and where they're headed uh, for postseason play or some have decided to just stay at home. And for K-State, they are playing after the regular season concludes, but they could not go on an NC State-like run, and uh, they will be finding themselves in the NIT this season, missing out on the NCAA tournament after obviously going deep last year, having a, a good season. This year, a lot of different circumstances led to this point. Um, there will be a time and a place to, to break down all that and go you know, even deeper in depth for what went wrong with this team, what needs to come up, all this other stuff. Uh, but this team still has games to be played. And honestly, until the games are done being played, I'm not sure we're going to have the full picture on what this team is going to have to work with in terms of a roster heading into next year. And then also what they have to work with, with the guys that are in the portal and who they're looking to add. But with that being said, I mean, what, what are some of the portal needs and immediate, okay, you got to go find a guy like this type of thing for K state, because the portal opened today. It is a, I mean, just a flood of guys going in. Uh, names that you might know. I, I know one of the first ones I saw, Brandon Garrison from Oklahoma State, has gone into the portal already, which is not a surprise. O State probably will lose a lot of guys after letting Mike Boynton go. Uh, so there's a lot of guys that are going to be out there. Where does K State need to search the hardest and make sure that they actually deliver? Uh, because I think that was part of the problem with this year's team is that they didn't overly deliver in the portal last year um it's tough to live up to the Keontae Johnson portal expectations but they also didn't come away with a guy that felt like a Desi Sills in last year's portal uh window so what are the immediate needs that K-State has to address in the portal and make sure they actually execute this year yeah it's interesting they'll need another they'll need everything uh and that's not to say they don't have anything, but it's dependent on what they will miss, what 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 will leave. We don't probably have all the answers to that either. But you're going to need some scoring. You're going to need a big man because uh, like Will McNair is going to be gone. Tyler Perry is going to be gone. So th those are two that like you know for sure, right? And, and there'll be a few others as well. But there, there will be space for Kansas State to add a guard, to add a wing, to add a big. So I don't think that the the search or the pursuit or the needs are necessarily razor fine. You're gonna need some scoring for sure. Uh, make sure you you get. I mean, obviously, you don't need like a true point guard if that's not the way you don't want to play. But a, a guy that can handle the ball and distribute a little bit, right? So. Uh, in, instead of maybe shoehorning someone in that it's not an ideal fit for that role. Now, Quez Glover would have been, so some of it's luck again with the injury thing and and all that. But at the same time, like, I yeah, I don't think that there's like a razor concentrated, like what you need here. I think you need to go get the best players, at least in the early goings until you know exactly what are maybe one or two final spots you have left to fill. Well, n nobody that is on this team currently is good enough to where you should feel like, well, we don't, you know, we don't want to bring a guy in here that, you know, upsets this guy's feelings or makes him feel like he's on the outs. Nobody that is coming back to play at K State next year is good enough to where you need to worry about how they're going to feel. I go out and get the best dudes available and make it work around them. Because I'd rather you do that than try to make it work and say, well, you know, we have these guys, so we need this. Uh, this team is not in that position right now in terms of what they have. We just saw, I think, what the peak of the team can be. And that was a team that won 19 games and was on the outside looking in of the NCAA tournament. Go out there and get the talent. And, you know, if that, if that upsets a guy like Cam Carter, if that upsets a guy like, uh, you know, whoever you want to throw into the mix there next, like, so be it, deal with it. But those guys were not good enough to be your top dudes in a season, and that's why you're in the NIT versus, you know, next year you're hoping that you have uh, higher ceiling guys and you can put those guys back in a role that they are better suited for. I, I agree with that. Another thing, too, 
is I like what you did in that first year, even when you had to like unload, reload with 11 or 13 guys, you got some multi-year guys that were going to come in and be at Kansas State for multiple years. You're talking about a David Gasson, a Cam Carter, right? Guys like that. I don't, I think we saw some cracks in the foundation, not, not at K-State, but like elsewhere too, that you can probably take some lessons from that if you just try to go add 10 transfers a year, and a lot of them are only one-year guys, and it's basically the paid mercenary look. You can really get yourself into trouble as well. Now, I will say this too, and this complicates things, which means maybe you still try to cap yourself on how many transfers you want to add a year, which means retention still has to be important, is that every transfer is technically a one-year guy because uh, it, there's no one-year free transfer. It's all unlimited at this point. Yeah, the, the other thing that I think I would add that they really did the first year that you didn't really get as good of return on in this last portal cycle was you need the guy like Desi Silts where you don't need every player to be like the star or a starter even as long as they own their role. And, and I think that you didn't see a lot of guys own their role that they took in last year. Uh, the other thing that I, this is just personally something that I would want is somebody that can consistently knock down shots from three because that was kind of an Achilles heel for this team where you, they would have one game where they'd shoot 47% from three and then another game that they'd shoot like 27%. So if they can find a knockdown shooter, I think that that would really open things up. I, I agree with that, but this team should have been better at shooting too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I I think that I, I'm I'm with you. They that you have to focus more on shooting because at the yeah. end of the day, you win games by putting the ball in the hole. And if you're going to turn the ball over as many times as K State did this year and the year prior, uh, as we've talked about, then you need to maximize the possessions you do get. And the best way to do that is by being able to score at a high level. So I, I think there needs to be a greater focus on it. It's one of the things that made Baylor such a a good team when Jerome Tang was with Scott Drew is they constantly had shooters. And we saw definitely down the stretch run of Jerome Tang's time there where they win a national title and all that. They were one of the consistently one of the best shooting teams in the country. There need to be more shooters. And, and that's why, like, if you have to go out and devote, you know, one, one swath of your NIL budget essentially to get a guy that can just consistently knock down shots. And I know it's not a given, but you go do that. The only – thing that has to be considered with that though is Tyler Perry was that kind of guy they thought coming from North Texas you have to be able to surround that type of player with other guys that are legitimate threats and the issue for Tyler Perry this season during parts of it was and he got better down the stretch he learned how to, to deal with it and play with it but he was having to try and find a way to make shots when defenses only had to worry about him or maybe one other guy making shots on them and so you're going to have to be able to build this up into a complete roster and have offensive threats that are uh, much more pressing for defenses than what K-State had this year. Because they really, we said three at times, that's on a good night. It was really like one and a half or two guys were scaring you on offense on any given night for K-State. And you just can't win games at a high level when that's the case. Yeah, it, it's, it was very hard for K-State to have it opened up and if they're going to keep the five out offense too you need guys that can knock down shots or else the same thing is just going to happen again to the next player so you, you also want the guys that are on the roster to take a jump from three as well that's true i mean I, and we thought maybe cam carter was doing it but uh, i i think at this stage cam is what he is we've seen him for two years now uh he's he's a fine option when he's you know, maybe the fourth or fifth most relied upon guy. He's just not going to be the uh, dude that should be in your top three of players because the turnovers are a real problem with him. Uh, and the shooting just isn't consistent enough there. So we'll see how that kind of goes and, and where K-State ends up falling on some of this. But uh, there will be more guys that enter and more guys that K-State has to target and pursue. And, I mean, this the, the portal target stuff, that, that went all the way down into July last year. Uh, so it's we're a long ways from things being decided in case state will be active in this for a very, very long time. Uh, anything else in the portal that K-State might need to look at or any unconventional 
uh, targets that they should probably explore. No, I mean, this this coaching staff can really coach defense. So um, I you got to figure out a way to get things rolling a little bit on offense. It's been a good defensive team now for two straight years. Shooting wise, it should have been this team should have been a better shooting team. Todd Perry is an excellent shooter. Arthur Kaluma was an excellent shooter for a while. The problem with him is, and that's why you got to temper, maybe qualify a little bit with the shooting. Arthur Kaluma is a good shooter, but his release is so slow that he has to be wide open to get it off. Tyler Perry's a really good shooter, but he's pretty small and he was bumping up a level. So, mm -hmm. and if you're going to be small and bumping up a level, you need to have like, like exorbitant range, like Marquise Noel, and be willing to take that shot often and knock it down often. So there, there's, 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 you know, there's, there's a lot of layers to being a good three point shooter or a good shooter in general um, to make it translate. Uh, one name that was already thrown out there that K State has uh, at least uh, reached out to is uh, Jacob Cruz from UT Martin, which he would kind of fit that bill. He averaged 19 a game and shot 42 percent from three. Some some of these guys though that come from the smaller schools and make the bump up. Uh, with that volume, I do have a little bit of concern about, but obviously if the shooting is there uh, and there's better size with Cruz than what like Perry had, I think that would still translate a little bit. But that's just one of many names that are going to be out there uh, in the coming days. And, and and the other thing to remember for people in the portal, you're going to hear names that K-State has contacted, and 30 minutes later that information is obsolete because that guy's already moved on somewhere else or K-State has no chance. Yeah, or K-State uh, interacts with them. Um and and uh deems him not a fit like yeah. all those things all those things mm -hmm. happen um marcus foster um not you're not not yeah. marcus foster that was on k-state before this mo uh, what what team does this guy play for by the way Furman. Furman. Furman transfer also has, uh has had dialogue with kansas state as well so that's that's another name um it's going to be interesting what what's going to be funny a little bit is that i do think a lot of teams are probably going to take someone that's going to end up being a mistake because everyone's going to try to duplicate what Tennessee did last year with Dalton Connect. Yeah, mm -hmm. as uh, that is a very good point. All right, well, that is uh, the, the kind of the the quick portal primer. There will be a lot more to come on this, and uh, certainly some more big picture stuff with the season and everything else. But we'll wait until games are actually done being played. Because K-State is still playing basketball. They are going to take on uh, Vermont, or not Vermont. Uh, that's that, still got Vermont on the break. They're going to take on Iowa in the NIT. Road game to Iowa City. Quick turnaround Tuesday night, 8 o'clock start time for the Cats and the Hawkeyes. Uh, first for, uh, for Drew, and then D.Y. can follow up after him. What are the thoughts on K-State accepting the NIT bid? I mean, I, I I think that it's a good thing, but I I think it's it, it's kind of like the catch twenty two of where if you don't do it, you get criticized, but if you do do it and you go on a run, people just don't care. So like you're you're kind of in that in between. But I I think for the program, it's probably the best thing to possibly do because you're seeing a lot of people kind of criticizing teams that aren't going to the NIT, Tom Crean being one of them, which I thought was kind of funny that it was him. Uh, but so you're kind of stuck in that position where if you can play more, I think it's always good, especially for the younger players. But it's also like if they wouldn't have accepted, I, I think I would have been okay too. I think the only reason not to accept is if you have a large portal exodus and you just don't have enough players or you have players – hurt that you know like david gasson will wonder like how much he'll play or if he'll play right uh, and see if he goes in and plays this postseason game in the nit or just works on his offseason um to get healthier right away but if assuming you don't have a large portal exodus assuming you have you know at least 10 11 guys willing to go out there and play and want to play then i have no problem with accepting the bid but like I do think it might become more of a trend over time, just like opting out of the NFL draft was was a foreign concept. Then the first two did it, like Leonard Fournette, Christian McCaffrey, and everyone's like, this won't be 
that popular. Well, now it's kind of popular, and now a lot of, a lot of guys do it. I worry. I don't really worry, but I think that could become what happens with this opting out of the NIT. Um, you know, I did a little crackpot research. I think oh, of teams that would actually be picked. I think only six opted out technically. Now St. John's, Indiana, Memphis, Ole Miss, Oklahoma, Pittsburgh that I saw. Don't think that I'm missing anyone there. So I don't think that's a ton. And there's still plenty of good high major teams that almost made the NCAA tournament that are still playing in the NIT. So I don't think it's a total sham or an embarrassing tournament to play in like some are making it out to be. Um, and I think you should play in it if you have a full team that's willing to do so and wants to do so. Because like there's of those six teams, I will say this, there, there's there's one or two on there where I kind of roll my eyes at a little bit um, that they're not playing in, in the NIT. Uh, unless there's a massive injury thing or, or a massive portal exodus that's going to take shape, then I think it's – like I think it's silly. I get that they're heartbroken because they were the first team out, but I think it's silly for Oklahoma to skip out on the NIT where they haven't made the NCAA tournament in like three or four years. Like no. you're not above the NIT. You can't even make the NCAA tournament. The NIT is exactly what you are actually. So that that's when it comes to mind. Pitt was in the first four last year. Like, you're not above yeah. the NIT. Like, give me a break. Um, yeah, Jeff Capel needs as many feathers in his hat that he can get uh, to to try and have some type of a resume there. I mean, that that's the one that's ridiculous to me. I almost think he's trying to trick the Pitt administration into thinking that he is actually, like, a good, stable head coach for them. And by saying, well, we're too good for the NIT – they believe that their uh, program is on better footing than it actually is. Like, you you played in a trash ACC. Congratulations. And uh, had the 343rd ranked non non. And lost to Missouri. Uh, yeah. Who sucks. Yeah. And, and, sucks. And, and, like, I understand the Memphis one just because Penny Hardaway didn't want to coach those guys anymore, and they didn't want to play for Penny Hardaway anymore, just like every Memphis team under Penny Hardaway. <laughs> Uh, St. John's Patina is too good for everything. So, and he's mm -hmm. a Hall of Famer. Like, I probably not going to consider that one. He can do what he wants. He's Rick Patino. I get it. Yeah. Like, he, he's done a lot of things. Indiana, like Mike Woodson, you're lucky you weren't fired. Just play in the NIT. Yeah. 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 I, that, I agree with that. And uh, we'll see, I guess, how uh, it works out for, and, for some other And things. some are doing it because they're like, oh, yeah, we just want to focus on the portal or maybe like trying to retain guys. You know, a good way to retain guys is to have them keep playing like they can't yeah. it's hard for them to enter the transfer it's portal is when they're actually playing basketball still that is uh that is a good point look i i think it's good that k-state took took the opportunity uh because i i think playing more basketball is not a bad thing i i think skipping the nit i think it's a selfish move i think we're seeing it as a selfish move for some of these coaches who think they're better than that jeff capel you are not better than that mike woodson you are not better than that uh, because Mike Woodson, you were a trash coach in the NBA as well. So well, this is nothing new for you. You would have played in the NIT if the NBA had it. Uh, <laughs> so, like, I think these Porter Mosier, selfish move. Congratulations. You and the Sister old, Jean keep riding the coattails of a lucky Final Four run in 2018, you two horrible human beings. Like, whatever. But the, the players old, the old. also, you owe it to your teammates, I think, because – Look, I maybe it maybe it sounds silly or whatever, but like if K State didn't play in this because they didn't have enough guys, I think guys that would have opted out, you owe it to Day Day Ames and RJ Jones and guys like that to continue to play more basketball and give them the opportunity to play more, play in a different environment where the games are impactful. Because I do think there is some benefit to these guys, not just playing more games and maybe being able to now, you know, have elevated roles because not that the games aren't important, but they don't mean as much in the NIT. I will admit to that. So it's more developmental. But then in addition to that, like you're getting experience in a tournament setting where it's, you know, win or go home. And I think that's beneficial moving forward. So I think it's just, I think overall it's a selfish move to opt out of the NIT because of, you know, the coaches wanting to save face or these players not giving it to their teammates who deserve it and you owe it to. I think the only coach on that list that that's probably good enough to say, you know, the NIT I'm, is like the one I talked about is Rick Patino. Yeah, I give Patino. Yeah. Patino's fine, but Patino's yeah, that's like a, a that's a that's kind of a different situation at St. John's where like 
It's his first year there, and he's so rapidly kind of flipped things for them where it, it kind of makes sense. Like, you can make the argument, like, yeah, we're, we're going to be better than this. Like, we're going to be in the tournament. Like, whatever. These other guys, though, you don't have the resume of Rick Patino, who for, you know, 30, we're, 40 years we've known all he does is get teams to the NCAA tournament. And a weird one was Chris Beard and Ole Miss. It was like, Beard, you've only been there for one year. Yeah, yeah. well. And, yeah, and they, they were the first team to say that they weren't because I and, was like – and Chris right. Beard should probably take as many opportunities to coach a game as he can before, you know, he gets removed from another job. So, uh, I don't know. That's I, I, I don't think you can act all high and mighty when you're somebody like Chris Beard. So that's, uh, that's my stance on that. Uh, all right. In, actual game situation, K state, Iowa, eight o'clock Tuesday night on ESPN. K state goes on the road. And if you're c- confused about that, uh, it has a lot to do with the way that the NIT has been reconfigured. So they seed the top four in each little bracket, and it goes to the first four out and the teams that were top of the net in the, the conferences that, that missed the NCAA tournament. K-State was not the, the top in the top two of the net teams of the Big 12 that got left out. So that's why UCF and Cincinnati get to host, which coincidentally – you look at the the bracket that K-State's in here, they've already played Villanova. They could possibly play them again, and obviously they've already played UCF, a conference mate. They could see uh, one of those teams down the road here. Uh, what do you make of the overall draw for K-State and then obviously game number one with Iowa? Game number one, oh, that, I mean, I have a hard time seeing them get past it, I'll be honest, because Iowa's basically Drastic the opposite. styles. Yes. Yeah, I was gonna say Iowa is basically the opposite of K State. They play a lot of offense and no defense. So, and and they do that every year. That's not them just saying, "Oh, this year." The, no, that that's Fran McCaffrey's entire career. Yeah, the the hard part for me is the the going on the road where this team has struggled on the road pretty mightily. So the getting a road game against Iowa, who can really put the ball in the basket, is yeah. probably yeah. The, were the worst possible draw. Yeah, and it, I I don't like to match up with Iowa, but say you do get to the second round, you 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 bring up some PTSD perhaps because you could play UC Irvine. <laughs> yeah, well, exercise some demons. That might that might be a home I, game if that were to happen. Get, yeah, you, yeah, probably you, would. Yeah, get, get UC Irvine or a potential Big Twelve game next year, playing going to Utah. Yeah, a little little preview there. Uh, look, I Iowa's a, a tricky one. I the point you make about K State going on the road. I think is significant. Like we've seen them struggle in road games. They have not won a road game since uh, they went to Morgantown the first week of January. So it, it's it's totally fair to question if they could actually come away with a victory. Uh, but Iowa being uh, – there's two ways that you can say this game goes. Either Iowa's offense is so elite that they just pull away from K-State and K-State can't keep up, or – It's K-State's defense is good enough to kind of drag Iowa down. And we've seen K-State be able to put together strong offensive performances against lacking defenses at times this season. So I'm not going to write this one off as, you know, an L as quick as some might. uh, But it does seem like a scenario where there's just too many things kind of stacked against K-State here uh, that it might make them. It might make it tough for them to get out of the first round of this thing. I don't love it. I don't love it because you you basically got to hope you got to hope that you can defend them well enough to where it's a close game, or they just run you know they just run you and out because their offense can be so good. Effort has been questioned within the last two weeks by Jerome Tang. How yeah. much do some of these guys have the effort and the energy the, to play in an NIT game? Yeah, and with that being said, I was in the NIT for a reason too. Right? I guess we are yeah. kind of pumping them up like they're the Harlem Globetrotters. Which Harlem Globetrotters aren't good. We're pumping them uh, up like the Harlem Globetrotters are frauds and overrated. If yeah, you want to go to a basketball up. game, go to a real basketball game. Yeah, we're pumping them up like they're a one seed in the NCAA tournament. They're not. They're, they, I mean, to be honest, they're they were kind of like Kansas State. They were kind of on the bubble, but knew they weren't going to be on the right side of the bubble, and they made the NCAA tournament last year. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll add to that. Uh, I mean, you, you brought up the effort level for K state. Like we don't know what the effort level for Iowa is going to be either. Like th- there's so many unknowns going into the NIT that it is 
kind of interesting to kind of think about like because you have to worry about these things like what what's the effort level going to be for both yeah. sides yeah that's true you you really don't know what you're going to get in this i you know if you have a team that's like really motivated uh basically anytime mike boynton had a team in the nit because that was their version of the ncaa tournament uh which again people that think i don't hate mike boynton i just was an early adopter of he's not a good head coach before, uh for that reason and I know they got a tough matchup out of the gate, but UCF could be yeah. dangerous. Yeah. No, and this UCF is the exact type of team that, like, it's typically it's either one of the really good mid majors that wins this or one of those, like, highly motivated power conference teams. And UCF would definitely fit the bill there. Honestly, like, that's going to be a pretty exciting matchup between UCF and South Florida. Uh, tomorrow night to see how that goes uh, also i mean how could i forget if k-state is able to make it to uh you know that that round of eight game or whatever they could possibly face salt miguel a little salt miguel revenge game with south florida yeah I'm, I'm trying to see the teams that i think like have the archetype to be dangerous in the other team each region are the villanova region there in the bottom right that's like i said that's ucf if usf wins it then it becomes him it might just be the winner of that game to be quite honest in the top right, my pick would probably be, to be honest, Loyola Chicago because that yeah. is a team that had a really good year in the Atlantic 10, and the Atlantic 10 is still an, an okay solid league. And the other teams there that are on their archetype, I think they're better than. Cincinnati, I don't think it would be completely thrilled to be in the NIT, kind of like K-State. Indiana State, I think, is probably going to be pissed off to be there, to be quite honest. So I would kind of like Loyola Chicago. I know you don't like that pick because it's sister team, but it is what it is. In the top left, I've been looking at this for quite a while. Like Providence and Seton Hall, the motivation probably isn't going to be there. But LSU, it might. I kind of like LSU. Unless yeah. North Texas is going to sit there and, and go back to back, which is potential. Like, right, they could do that. But LSU has talent, and this is probably like an NCAA tournament for them because – the. And there was one time where they didn't even think they were going to be playing in this, I'm sure. So I think LSU is pretty good. And in the bottom left, I, I think about the winner of that Georgia Xavier game or Richmond or Ohio I, State. I think Ohio oh. State, yeah. Ohio yeah. State would Actually, be the that one. Bottom le that bottom left region has a lot of teams. I think Georgia, Xavier, Richmond, and Ohio State, and Cornell, all. Yeah, I think Ohio State is probably the one where that's like you've got the rah rah right now with Jake Diebler, and, and it's a little different that he's been, you know, he's got the the actual job now. But I do think that that would still be one where you you think to yourself, okay, those guys are going to want to kind of play well for him, finish on a high note, and take it into next season. I would agree, although that that first round game of Cornell is a little tricky. Yeah, a hey, shout out to the Ivy League sneaking a, a handful of teams into this thing. Princeton, a two seed, getting a host. Uh, how about that? Uh, okay, so K State, K State, and Iowa. Yeah, Kevin Kruger, watch out. Maybe UNLV is motivated for this uh, from the overrated Mountain West. Uh, K State and Iowa going to to square off Tuesday night. Uh, give me the game picks from you guys on what happens in Iowa City. I, I think Iowa because they're at home. They just score a little too much for K-State. That, that that five seems about right. I think Iowa by about that much. Yeah, I, I just think that Iowa ends up outscoring K-State because I, I think that in a game where you kind of question how much people are going to care, that it's going to be kind of an offensive showcase. So, uh, but and I don't, I just don't think the K-State has the firepower to pull it off. And when you hear the name Patrick McCaffrey and you go Franz boy, Franz boy. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Is. Franz boy. Cause, Cause he has a million sons apparently. Yeah. He's got one that they're recruiting again. There is well, honestly, uh, if, if you know that you, you're going to have talented kids, just having a ton of them and like being able to sell that pipeline. I mean, <laughs> Greg McDermott probably should have had more kids and he might still be the head coach at Iowa state. If he could have just said, Hey, look, I got boys coming. You just got to give me some time. Uh, so I actually think it's a genius move by Fran McCaffrey. He he should have another one right now, and he by himself eighteen years. He probably right? he probably does have another one. He probably he probably does. Uh, yeah. To to the point you're talking about Iowa this season. Uh, they their only home losses. They only have four of them, and since uh, I mean they only have one dating back to the start of February. Um. Because they lost two uh, in January to Purdue and Maryland back to back, 
and then they all they lost at home to Michigan uh, in early December. But and from it would have been the 24th on of January. They didn't lose at home again until they faced Illinois on the last day of the regular season. So they've been pretty tough at home. They have wins over Penn State, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio State uh, during that time. So it's not like they've beaten the most dangerous of opponents. They haven't had the toughest paths there, but uh, it is something to keep in mind. They've been pretty sturdy at home uh, this season, despite a few hiccups here and there. So yeah, we'll just see. Those Maryland and Michigan ones are kind of brutal. Yeah, honestly, the more you, you the more you look at it, you go, okay, K State and Iowa probably pretty similar in how their seasons played out, minus the fact that uh, you have to flip flop who's good at defense and offense and who's bad at defense and offense. So it'll be interesting to see. I think I think Iowa probably gets over the hump and gets it done. I think just being at home. Uh, but I, I'm not going to be surprised if K State wins, and I, I won't phone it in on them, but. I look forward to, to seeing how it all goes down. Uh, any concerns about K State? You know, you mentioned David Gasson earlier, but any concerns about K State going in there with anything less than what they had when they faced, uh, you know, Texas and Iowa State in the Big 12 tournament? And then in addition to that, uh, would any of you toy with giving more minutes to, to the younger guys just to try and get them a little bit more experience before the season ends? Any concerns that there was anything less? Well, maybe David Gasson just depends on when he wants to kind of heal up and recover. But other than that, th there could be just because of the time of the year. The transfer portal is open today, so who knows? Uh, we're probably not going to get that opportunity because the, the show was last night. You would typically probably get like a media availability today to maybe inquire about that, but I'm sure they're leaving for Iowa City today since they're – play tomorrow night so that that's something that you know maybe you can poke around on but i don't know that you're going to get any real answers plus i don't know if they want to reveal that yet anyways or, or if there would be any you know benefit to do that it's almost a benefit not to at this point and then in terms of how you know day day was already playing quite a bit he played a lot in the big 12 tournament you know i would keep hitting the gas and accelerate on that but i wouldn't change anything maybe get RJ out there a little bit more, but I just, you still want to play to win and, and you feel like you're doing your team a disservice. If you're just going to accept the bid to not do what it takes to win. Yeah. I, I would keep rotation pretty similar to how it is now. I mean, I, maybe RJ a little bit more, but we saw him play. It felt like a lot in the big 12 tournament. Yeah. And, and if he's going to play, he's, he's got to hit those shots. I think, what was mm -hmm. it? Was it, the Texas game where he goes over three from the three point line. Yeah. Yeah. He came, he made sure to get his looks. Uh, that's for sure. So we'll see how it goes, but K state, Iowa, eight o'clock in the NIT. And then uh, maybe they will be playing more games. Maybe they won't be. And uh, once the season wraps up, we'll be able to look a little bit more big picture about what happened this year for K state, kind of what went wrong and what led to them being an NIT team. First time K state's playing in the NIT since the 2009 season, uh, which is, that this would be my one consolation to people that are like, yeah, the NIT, we're, we're better than that. Uh, I mean, I would rather play in the NIT than, you know, five times in seasons where you don't make the NCAA tournament and then Bruce Weber just completely whiffing five seasons and, you know, you go five tournaments, five not. That doesn't seem very fun to me. I know it's not the NCAA tournament and everything, but there can still be joy in this. And uh, as maddening as this team is, I would rather have K-State basketball in my life than not, uh, and having the ability to watch my team play is a lot more fun than watching other teams play. So that's uh, kind of where I side with it, and we'll see how K-State goes and looks in Iowa City on Tuesday night against the Hawkeyes. So that will do it for us, for Drew Galloway and Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth. You can get more news on the Cats over at kstateonline.com. Head over to On3, uh, become a member if you're not, and you'll get everything you need on K-State football and basketball recruiting with both as well because obviously the transfer portal is kicking up for basketball and football is getting ready to start back up a uh, busy time with unofficial visits throughout March and uh, spring football. So plenty of stuff going on with K-State right now, even though a uh, season is winding down for basketball and football is still months away from kicking back off. But head over there, get it all checked out. It's at on3kstateonline.com. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more content right here for